This video is a short introduction to free electron lasers. So the fundamental problem here is that we want to be able to do time-resolved atomic scale imaging and a solution is the free electron laser. So let us begin by looking at what exactly the free electron laser is. So fundamentally it's a linear electron accelerator uh, with an external magnetic field to make the electrons oscillate and this magnetic field is called the wiggler. There are two basic types, a uh, planar wiggler, uh, which is more common, it's easier experimentally, and the helical wiggler, which is theoretically easier to treat. And that's essentially it. This video is divided into two parts. First, we're going to look at the theoretical foundations of how the free electron laser actually works. And in the second part, we're going to look at some interesting applications. Let's begin by trying to understand the theory of the free electron laser. So I'm going to aim to highlight two important features of any laser source um, and how they arise for the free electron laser. So first of all, we want amplification of radiation intensity in the laser cavity. Uh, and we also want that radiation to be coherent. So first of all, many experiments require coherent radiation, but also uh, it's a question of intensity. So for an incoherent light source, the intensity scales with the number of oscillators, but for a coherent one, it scales with the square of the number of oscillators. Considering first the helical wiggler, where the magnetic, magnetic vector potential is just rotating around in the xy plane as we go along z, so it's just drawing out a helix. We want to understand how this helical wiggler affects the motion of the electrons. So from classical electrodynamics we know that the Hamiltonian of an electron in, in an electromagnetic field is just the relativistic expression for energy where now the kin kinematic momentum is written in terms of the canonical momentum minus a factor due to the presence of the electromagnetic field. So you can see that with this helical wiggler, the Hamiltonian is independent of x and y, which means that the canonical momenta in both the x and the y direction are conserved. But since before the wiggler, the electrons are just moving along the z-axis, we know that the initial value is zero. This now means that we can solve for the kinematic momentum and hence get an expression for the normalized perpendicular velocity vector which being proportional to the magnetic vector potential is again just rotating helically around as we go along the z-axis. At this stage it should be noted that the reason for introducing this constant parameter capital K is because it turns out that the only difference between the planar and the helical wiggler is the value of this constant so that the exact same equations that we're deriving here can be used to understand a free electron laser with a planar wiggler. Next, we should add the radiation field E into the cavity, we're, which we're assuming to be circularly polarized in the xy plane. So it can again be, writ be written as uh, uh, trigonometric functions in the x and the y directions, this time with time dependence, of course, because it's an oscillating electromagnetic field. And we're interested in the energy exchange between the electrons and this field. So using just the well-known formula that the change in energy is given by the dot product between the force and the displacement of the electrons, which we can write down in terms of the velocity and the change in time, uh, we get that the change in the relativistic energy because the electromagnetic field is in the xy plane is just proportional to the perpendicular velocity. Assuming that the electrons are ultra relativistic so they're moving at almost the speed of light we can change the time derivative into a spatial derivative and then computing the dot product with the help of a trig identity we see that the change in the energy is proportional to sine theta where theta is the ponderomotive phase 
It's a, one of the most important parameters of the free electron laser. We're also going to require the derivative of it with respect to z, um, and we're going to write this down in terms of the renormalized parallel velocity now, and expand the parallel velocity in terms of the perpendicular one, just using the properties of the gamma factors. And we're going to be interested in finding the zeros of this derivative. This corresponds to the resonance condition where the energy is always transferred either to or from the electromagnetic field to the electrons. We can use this to obtain an expression for the resonance energy or the resonance wavelength of the electromagnetic field in terms of the energy of the electrons in the accelerator and the periodicity of the wiggler. So we can essentially tune the electron energy to get radiation at a desired frequency. Plugging the expression for the resonance energy, gamma naught, into the expression for the change of the ponderomotive phase and doing a linear approximation, so assuming that we're close to resonance, we can now express the change in the ponderomotive phase in terms of a relative distance away from resonance. So that d theta by dz is just simply proportional to the relative energy away from resonance once I get my gamma naughts the right way around. And the final step now is to write down the equations of motion of the electrons in terms of this relative or normalized energy eta. So labeling, if I could only spell labeling, each of the electrons with j, uh, we now finally get the equations of motion for the ponderomotive phase and the relative energy. That looked quite simple. So these two coupled equations relating the change in the ponderomotive phase to the change in the energy of each of the electrons now controls the evolution of the system. And to understand what these equations mean, consider that an electron is initially at resonance. So the ponderomotive phase is constant, but if the ponderomotive phase does not give the rate of change of energy matching that of the rate of supply of energy due to the accelerating field, the relative energy starts drifting, which means that the ponderomotive force will start drifting until the ponderomotive phase is at resonance and it matches the energy supply to the electron. Now this means that all the ponderomotive phases of each of the electrons become equal modulo the wavelength given by 2 pi over the sum of the wave vector lengths of the wiggler and the radiation field. This now results in what is known as micro-bunching. So initially the electrons are uniformly distributed inside the particle accelerator, but as a result of this drift in the ponderomotive phase, we get these tight bunches of electrons separated by the characteristic wavelength of the free electron laser. So we now finally have the two key properties of the free electron laser. So we get coherent emission of radiation, with amplitude increase related to the energy supply rate. Um, this is lasing action and we have ourselves a free electron laser which concludes the first part of this video. Up next, applications. In the second part of this video on free electron lasers we will look at the applications of the x-rays produced. The brightness of x-rays produced by free electron lasers far exceeds that of conventional synchrotron sources used in the past. In fact, the brightness can often be up to 10 billion times brighter. The increased brightness often leads to far sharper X-ray diffraction images, which is one of the main uses of free electron laser X-rays. Related to the brightness is the intensity, which is sometimes said to be up to 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. This is enough to punch through steel. This is a typical setup for a free electron laser. An electron gun is used to produce electrons. They are then passed through an electron accelerator where a very high potential causes them to accelerate to close to the speed of light. 
On the right of this diagram, we have the Wiggler magnets which cause the electron to follow an oscillating path. This causes the electrons to produce radiation in the form of X-rays. We'll now get stuck into the applications of free electron lasers. In this video we'll only consider two, but of course there are many, many more. The first application we're going to look at is dynamic compression. We'll then go on to look at molecular movies or molecular imaging. So first off, let's consider dynamic compression. Dynamic compression is used to study the um, structure of materials at very high pressures. This is typically far higher than could be achieved using static compression techniques in the lab. To make this clear, let's consider an example. We start off by taking a very thin layer of our material. We then shine an optical laser on it. The optical laser causes ablation to occur at the surface. This causes a very high pressure shock wave to pass through the material. This is similar in form to a sound wave, although the pressures will be much higher. The shock wave often lasts for several hundred nanoseconds and it's not uncommon for the pressure to reach up to terapascals during this time. After 100 nanoseconds, for example, the structure could look like this. Initially we had a sort of FCC structure, but here it could have changed to BCC, for example. One example, experimentally, is iron. At high pressures, iron changes from a BCC to a HCP, or hexagonal close pack structure. This occurs above about 10 gigapascals. But where does the free electron laser come into all this? So far we've just considered the compression of the material. The X-ray free electron laser is often used for the diffraction experiments, where, we, where it's used to image the compressed structure and see how it changes with time. To achieve this, they use two different pulses, the first being the optical laser pulse, which compresses the material, followed by, after some time delay, the x-ray pulse. Burying delta T then allows them to piece back together how the structure changes with time. A thin layer of sample is placed in front of an x-ray description screen. By shining in the optical laser followed by the x-ray pulse, we obtain a diffraction image on the screen. Using the free electron laser allows us to determine the structure of rocks at very high pressures, for example at the centre of the Earth. This is important for geology, where it enables us to learn the sound velocity. It can also be used to test the theoretical predictions of the phases of materials at very high pressures, and potentially lead to new and cool structures that we haven't seen before. This concludes the section on dynamic compression. We'll now look at the second application of molecular imaging. In molecular imaging, we use pump probe experiments to excite a molecule to excited state. We we'll then use the free electron laser to take snapshots of how the structure changes with time. Assembling many of these snapshots allows us to create a molecular movie in femtosecond time resolution. Here we again use x-ray diffraction to image how the molecules change with time. The UV laser excites molecules into an excited state or initiates a reaction. The 
can study the progress of a reaction in real time using the same method we used for the dynamic compression. The UV pump pulse excites molecules in the sample into the excited state. Molecules in the excited state can undergo a change in structure. For example, a ring opening can occur from a conjugated ring into a straight molecule. This diagram shows the route by which we excite the molecules. We start in the ground state and excite into the frank condon region of the excited state. After some time delta T, we then excite with the second X-ray pulse. By varying delta T, this allows us to see how the structure changes with time. We need to record a separate frame for each step in the movie. This is because after the X-ray pulse, the molecule undergoes a Coulomb explosion. This method allows us to watch the reaction in real time with femtosecond resolution. And because the X-ray laser is so bright, we only need a few molecules to be hit by the pulses in order to get a sharp diffraction image. For example, we can watch how thousands of atoms in a protein move on a molecular scale. We'll now conclude this video by showing a couple of molecular movies which have been made using free electron lasers. Here we see a cyclic conjugated ring undergoing a ring opening reaction and straightening out into a linear molecule. And here we see the whole structure of a protein change slightly as an outside molecule approaches.